Hello and welcome back to the channel. Here's a video about what's in my everyday carry, and specifically what's in my everyday carry when I go on a trip. The occasion here is I've been invited to spend a week out on Cape Cod, and I've got to decide what to bring. Now, if you're not from this area, going to Cape Cod for me, you don't have to ask me twice. It's one of the most serene and peaceful places that I know of in the entire world. Of course, that means it's been discovered, and on weekends in the summer, which is when I'm going to be there, it seems like everybody from New York City or Boston wants to go there. Despite the fact that so many people vacation there and the fact that there is relatively little land, it's pretty surprising that you can still find places where you still feel like you're just by yourself. You just have to be willing to walk along the beach away from the path that most people go to and you sort of find your own little peaceful corner of the world. But getting there can be an issue. Cape Cod is bigger than it looks. Once you pass the Bourne or Sagamore bridges over the Cape Cod Canal, those are scary bridges, by the way. They're really tall. They have to be that way so that ships can go underneath them. It's another 60 miles to Provincetown. That's the town at the tip of Cape Cod. And that 60 miles can take you up to two to three hours in the summertime. And there's very little up there in Provincetown. I've often wondered where those cars park. But anyway, the geography of the area, Provincetown is the very tip. The next town down is Truro, and the one down from that is Wellfleet. All of them are wonderful areas. All of them are extremely expensive places to live. My friend is renting a cabin right on the water in Truro on a beach called Cornhill Beach. And I've been told that it is sparsely furnished. That is in keeping with what I've seen with these cabins. I've noticed that they are not only sparsely furnished, but they're very small and they're usually very expensive to stay. But she says there's a spare bedroom and she's going to be gone most of the day and I can just use the spare bedroom if I want. Well, okay. What am I going to bring? Well, last summer I was out there and I actually forgot about this. I brought my X-T8 when I was out on Cape Cod and I was really surprised at how pristine the skies are out there. Despite the fact that Boston is to your west by only about 30 miles, something, something about the water just seems to tame that. And if you're looking east, there is nothing until England, I guess. And the south and northern horizons are excellent also. I was really, really surprised at how good the skies were. And I had forgotten this, but my another friend of mine said, well, you know, I, I have a friend who has a telescope, and the next thing I know, this was unplanned. I was giving a talk, and I was doing a sky watch, and they really liked it. Well, some of those people are going to be back in that same place, and they've gotten wind that I'm going to be there. So I was actually planning on taking something a little bit smaller. I had the X-T8 last year, and I, I was going to take this. This is the Celestron 6-inch F5 Omni, and I thought I'd maybe put it on that SV-225 out as mount head on a tripod. But I'm thinking, just based on how excited these people are, I'm probably going to have to take the X-T8 again. For the astrophotography rig, which I plan to keep running all night long if I could find a suitable location, this is the Red Cat 51, controlled by the ASI or Smart Controller AM3 harmonic mount on the matching tripod. This rig, when you collapse it all the way down, can fit in front of the passenger seat complete. Well, I've got some packing to do, and not only do I have to get this and the X-T8 in there, I'm going to bring a bike because the biking is out there. I've been told that there are no linens or sheets or towels. I've got to bring those. In fact, I've been told, when in doubt, bring it. So this is it here. This is home for the next week, and this building was referred to as the Ice House. There was a rail line that ran right about there, and this was right at the railway station. Around 1932, they converted it to a small residence. So let's go ahead and come inside here. I don't know how many of you are into historic homes, but here in New England, if you do have a historic home, there's sort of a vested interest here in trying to keep it period so that you actually feel like you are in the 1930s. So along the cabinet here, it's customary to sign your name as a guest. I guess we'll do that before we leave. I brought this mid-2000s era Fuji aluminum road bike to ride around. Didn't take one of my best bikes. The performance is not the issue here. The issue is just to roll around and have a good time. As you can see, it is a little bit 
newer and bigger inside than it might appear from the outside. And this is one of the bedrooms. It's up on the loft. And the loft is actually nicer than where I'm staying in this tiny bedroom. My main concern is this ladder. If I have to get down in the middle of the night, I don't want to break my neck. So I am here in this tiny little bedroom. There's nothing here. This is the whole room. And there's a fan on the ground. It does get hot and humid here, but there's no power outlet. I couldn't find it at first, but it, there is one. It's up here and there's a light that you turn on and there's a little outlet down there where you can plug something in. So there actually is a power outlet. So as we move towards the back, here's where we lose all illusions that we're in the turn of the 20th century. Canon C100 cinema camera to the left, which I'm going to be using to film myself. On the right, I told you I was going to take the Orion X-T8. I wound up not being able to do that. I just ran out of space. So I did wind up taking the Celestron 6-inch F5 Omni reflector on the SV-225 mount head and AVX legs. So this is what I'm probably going to use for the imaging. Red Cat 51, AM3 mount, ASI 2600 MC camera, 30 millimeter F4 William Optics guide scope, and an ASI 120 MM guide camera, all controlled by the ASI Air smart controller with the antenna that you see in the back. So this is the view. We are right on the water. This is just stunning. And I don't know if this is coming across on camera, but there's a thing they call, they have out here called the Cape Light. There's a special kind of blue quality there that you don't really see in a lot of places. It has something to do with its location on the earth and the amount of humidity that's here. So that sandy strip there is probably where I'm going to wind up setting the imaging rig. It's further than it may look on camera here, so I've given up all thoughts of using an extension cord and running it out there. So instead, I'm probably going to wind up using this Jackery 290. This power supply has worked well for me in the past, but I've never run it all night. And it's, as you can see, it's not the biggest power supply in the world. Well, okay, they've said that it's going to be cloudy all day, but as you can see, it's already cleared up. If that holds true, I'm going to set up tonight and we'll take some images and see what happens. So the forecast did clear up. I was really facing the possibility that there would be no clear nights at all this week, but it looks like tonight might be good and even the third night might be good. Those of you in West Texas or Arizona or New Mexico might not be terribly impressed by all of this, but around here, three clear nights in one week, that's playing with the house's money. So I set up the Red Cat out back and I had a couple of concerns. Number one is that there would be blowing sand and the air is moist and it's salty. And when I wake up every morning, there's a layer of fog about four feet off the ground. That's, uh, yeah, that Red Cat's gonna be in there and you can bet there's some salty air in there. I was also concerned about the Jackrius. I showed you earlier, it's a small battery, it works fine, but I had it running all night long doing seven hours or so worth of things. When I woke up this morning, first thing I did, I looked out the window and the Red Cat had homed itself to the home position pointing at Polaris. That's the last thing I asked it to do in the plan, so at least it did make it that far. I got out there, it did everything I asked of it to do, and the Jackery was at 6%. Look at that. I think I'm going to have to rig something up with an extension cord because I don't want to run into the power supply running out. So I had to take images of M8 and M31 last night. I'm going to do more tonight on different objects. Let's see how those turn out. So here's a tip. You need to be careful with all of these little wires and plugs and jacks. Those things can fail and ruin your day. I've seen especially that you want to be careful with the DC input jacks that supply power to these devices. Several of you have written in to say that yours have failed, and we have had club members have those things fail and have the entire unit have to get sent back overseas for repair. Now, for some reason, I will see guys, and it's always a guy, who will just push this thing in so hard and then, I don't know, for good luck maybe, they'll take their palm and then just slap the thing in there for good measure. Yeah, don't do that. You don't have to prove that you're stronger than all of these little wires and plugs. You are.
So last night, I did a skywatch for some people and I felt it went very well. The location, outstanding. High up, above this fog in the morning, very dark, and I had permission from the owner to leave this rig running all night long on an extension cord, no need to worry about a battery running out. Perfect, right? Well, when I fired up the rig, everything was working but the auto guider. I don't know what went wrong. I tried recalibrating the auto guider. I tried restarting the system. I tried reinstalling the firmware. Nothing. Those of you who do astrophotography know if everything works but the auto guider, it is just plain maddening. Well, I couldn't figure it out, so I figured I'll just take everything back here. Just for luck, one last time, I went outside here fired it up again, same thing, nothing. Well, I figured I can't fix this thing here, we'll just have to go home with it. At the very last moment, I noticed the stars on the auto guider were just a little bit bigger than what I'm used to seeing. The nearest thing I can figure what happened is that this thing has been driven around by, you know, some 200 miles or so, the focus wandered by just a tiny bit. Spent a few minutes just fiddling with the focus everything snapped back in and everything just started working. Terrific. <laughs> the problem with this is it didn't get fixed until after midnight. I only had about four hours or so to collect data. If I looked uncomfortable in that last video clip, I was. The temperature here all week has hovered right around 100 degrees Fahrenheit. There is no air conditioning in this boathouse. There are fans and you can open the windows but in order to film that segment, I had to turn off the fans so that you didn't hear them on the microphones. What a difference a day makes. I woke up this morning and the temperature plummeted to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. I was shivering. I didn't even have a blanket over me. As you can see, I'm wearing a lot more clothes right now. So I've had a wonderful week here. I biked close to 210 miles in six days. And I don't know if any of you live on the shores or if you have access to the ocean, but I come here about once a year and I find being on the Cape really captures that sense of being a kid on his summer vacation all over again. Long, hot, lazy afternoons, walks on the beach. It isn't so much about what I did with my summer vacation, it's about how I felt on my summer vacation. So with the telescope, I did wind up bringing the 6-inch F5 Celestron Omni, as I showed you earlier, on the Altaz mount. For the eyepieces, I decided to go minimalist this time. Normally, I bring a bunch of stuff with me, but not this time. I tried to see if I could get away with only two eyepieces, and it worked for the Skywatch, and it's worked for me here. I spent a lot of time looking at the late summer and early fall objects using only the Teleview 24mm Panoptic, and the Teleview 11 millimeter Nagler. I never wanted for anything else. I had two and a half nights of good seeing for astrophotography. I'm gonna process that data very shortly. So it's our last night here and a bunch of us are going out to Provincetown. That's the tip of Cape Cod. If you ever come to this area, that town is a must see. You know, when I was a kid, adults would tell me, <laughs> We lived three and a half hours away. There was no way we were gonna come here, but adults would tell me, don't go there. <laughs> Provincetown has a well-deserved reputation for being a wild and uninhibited place, especially at night. That is changing. I think I was probably born a little bit too late to see this because I come out here every year and it seems more genteel every year. Mostly I see tourists walking around just wanting to have a good time. The artists and the fishermen, the people who have traditionally lived in Provincetown, can't afford to live here anymore. Every year when I come here, I see more really big houses being put up. Since I am going out to Provincetown with the people, it's going to be a wonderfully clear night tonight. I don't have time to be here with the astrophotography rig, so I'm going to set the Red Cat outside, run a plan on the ASI Air that will let you do a series of objects starting at a particular time. You take a certain number of frames on each object and you move on. That works well most of the time, but not all of the time. And I may be talking about that at some point in the future. 
Obviously, when you do this, you don't have the ability to focus. You just have to rely on your, uh, the focus that was achieved the last time you were out and hope that nothing has wandered. And obviously, your polar alignment isn't going to be perfect, but hey, it's what we've got. Uh, let's see what happens. You know, there's an old saying about Cape Cod. If you come here and you get sand in your shoes, you'll be back. <laughs>